right, continuing with this series of videos, uh, <laughs> whatever, looking at conventional theory on how the physical universe, or at least parts of it, work, and uh, providing uh, perhaps uh, alternative perspective and such. So we're at lecture 23. And uh, this is an exam review, so a review of Maxwell's equations, essentially. Let's first take a stationary loop. I Could be a new post. Expand the major part of one lecture. Research. Say this is a conducting wire, and it has a resistance capital R. The net resistance of the entire wire. And suppose here, I have a changing magnetic field, and this area right here is A. And the magnetic field, let's say, is perpendicular to the blackboard. And the strength of the field is B, and so the magnetic flux phi of B is then simply A times B. And so the phi dt is then A times dB dt. Remember, we were going to keep the geometry constant. It's a, it's a stationary system. But we're going to change the magnetic field. So this magnetic field is changing. Perhaps it's coming out of the blackboard now. And maybe it's increasing. And so you induce them in this. Uh, it does confuse things a little bit now. He's calling the magnetic field A. <laughs> you know, just, but whatever. Um, this is a little bit on the subject of his theory, uh, you know, that... Um, something gets induced in a wire uh, that there's more than one voltage in the same location and all that mess um, but I don't think we want to get to that in this series we'll wait till after <laughs> you know comment further on what seems a pretty nonsensical assertion conducting wire and EMF and the EMF has this magnitude this is the magnitude of the induced EMF. And so the current that is going to flow, that is the induced current, is the induced EMF divided by the resistance of that whole conducting loop. The direction is never an issue because you all can handle Lenz's law. Notice I didn't even put a minus sign here because the EMF is of course minus the phi dt. That's not important for me. We put a minus sign here, but I put these bars there, so get rid of minus signs. Because if the magnetic field is coming out of the board, and if it were increasing, then Lenz's law will run a current in this direction to oppose that increase. And so minus signs in general are for the birds. You can always reason in which direction the current is going. Yeah. So that's a case. Okay, yeah, it worked. Um, but yeah, this sort of is important, because, you know, they're always doing this in this you know, this magnetic field, which is always, what, it's just the north end or the south end of a magnet, uh, you know, it gets much more complicated if you're using more than just one end of a magnet <laughs> to create your magnetic field. And these are always examples where the field is always in a direction in the sense that it's always a magnet pointed right at you. Is whereby we have a stationary loop and whereby the magnetic field is the geometry. Now we'll have a case where... Say, I mean, you could, you could f create circumstances that would be sort of like alternating current in the sense, let's say you made one of these loops and you tied a string to it and you had a magnet that dangled in the middle and you could swing it back and forth through the loop. The magnetic field would essentially be an alternating current. I mean, it's going to go north this way, and then the south end is going to be showing on the wire, and then it's going to come towards it, so the, it's going to go away from it, then it's going to come towards it, and then it's going to go away from it, and then come to, they're both of, and both fields are going to be different. And, you know, they don't really account for any, any of the real world circumstances here, I don't think. Right. Magnetic field, say, is constant. We have here a conducting wire. And we have a magnetic field, for instance, coming out of the blackboard, uniform. Uniform is always nice when we do integration. To get this flux, it's always nice to have B uniform. All right, so uniform means that it's coming from all sides, or, you know, again, these words, you know, he uses the word non, 
non something. What the hell is it? Non something to describe a regular magnet because it's doing something non uniform. I guess that's what he says non uniform. And now, what does uniform mean? So, again, it's. And we have a bar here which has length L. This is length L here. And we move the bar with velocity V to the right. So, this is a very simple case. V is here perpendicular to the bar. That makes it always easier. And B is perpendicular to the plane through V and L. So, that makes all sines of theta that we may have, or cosines of theta, all one. Magnetic field is constant. And so the magnetic flux, phi of B, is the area times the magnetic field. The angles are just wonderful. So that is B times X times L if this distance is X. So the magnetic flux change in time, d phi B dt. Notice I don't care about minus signs. I don't need not minus signs. That d phi dt is therefore L times B times the x dt, and the x dt is the velocity. So the magnitude of the EMF is L D V. Why isn't that working? And so the current that is going to flow. Really irritating. Um, <clears throat> so that these it does create an a, a interesting circumstance. Because first you have two things, right? So if you move the wire, you're essentially making the 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 net that you're capturing energy with bigger. Um, but what you're also doing, is, you know, so the total wire is bigger, but then you're also just the fact that you've, you're moving one piece. And this one piece is going to be the piece where the pressure is going to be changing. So the other pieces are just part of the system, really. And the only piece that's really, really important is the one that's moving because it's getting closer and further from the field. And therefore it's the thing pressurizing. The induced current is that value, LBV, divided by the resistance R, and that is the resistance then that is in this entire loop. Whatever there is and where it is, I don't care, but that is the magnitude of the current. The direction is, again, easy, it's non-negotiable. If I move this bar to the right, the magnetic flux is increasing. It's pointing in this direction, the magnetic field, so the current is going to flow in such a direction that it opposes that change, and so the current will flow in this direction. And I just point out again, it's there's no opposition to anything. There's just either there's something getting pressurized or depressurized, and that's all there is. It's not it's not trying to be uncooperative in some way. It's not fighting something. It's just that you're creating this mirror effect. So when you're pushing the bar in, um, uh, let's see which way would it go. You're yes pressure so that means you're making more of a mirror and then when you're pulling the bar out you're making less of a mirror that's the induced current and this is the magnitude in 1996 NASA attached a 20 kilometer conducting wire called a tether to the shuttle so L was 20 kilometers the magnetic I don't know why they didn't repeat this, actually. It's kind of strange. This, it seems an interesting experiment, but yes, yeah, 20, 20 mile long wires, a <laughs> long wire. Um, but the interesting thing was, is yeah, it, it, uh, it burned up. You know, it collected so much energy, it's, uh, you know, fried. No way to dissipate heat. The field of the Earth is about half a Gauss, even at a distance of 200 miles, that's not much different from here. So it is 5 times 10 to the minus 5 Tesla. And the shuttle, as you should know from 801, like any near-Earth satellite, they all fly with a speed of about 8 kilometers per second. If they go much faster, then they would leave the gravitational field of the Earth. So V is about, in circular orbit, is about 8 kilometers per second. So here you have it in meters per second. If I calculate for this tether moved around, if I calculate LBV, I would get 8 kilovolts. However, keep in mind that that is only correct if B were perpendicular to the plane through LV, and also if the velocity of the shuttle were perpendicular to the direction of the wire. None of that is the case. The magnetic field where they were is not exactly perpendicular to the plane through V and L. And so what they observed was three and a half kilovolts, about half of the maximum that you could achieve. 
You may say, gee, this is strange, because if you just drag a conducting wire through space, you don't have a closed loop circuit, so you can't talk about the idea of a magnetic flux, because you have no surface. Well, at the altitude where the shuttle is flying, there is still a teeny weeny little bit of air, very little, but some, and that is highly ionized because of the ultraviolet light from the sun. We call that the ionosphere, it's a plasma. And so, in the surrounding of this wire, here and here, you have a conducting medium. And so, current can flow through that medium, this way or this way, and that's exactly what will happen. So that you don't know precisely the path current will flow. So, you so the question would be is whether this really is um, because they're somehow traveling across the magnetic field, which, uh, you know, who knows, <laughs> you know, or whether they're just picking up the energy because they're going through this plasma. So he's just sort of pointing out there's a plasma there. You're ripping a, line, a wire through it. You're going to be hitting the plasma and you'll collect the energy from the plasma. So who knows which is which. You have closed loops. And so it is meaningful to talk about magnetic flux change and about the EMF, the induced EMF that is generated as a result of that. The thing that NASA could not predict very well was the current. Because you do not quite know what the resistance is of that closed loop. You know what the resistance is of the cable, but you don't know what the resistance is of the current as they flow through the ionosphere. But the net result was that they had a current I in the wire of about one ampere. It was very tragic because this current was so high that the conducting wire melted, and the tether broke off, and very early on in the experiment, the tether separated from the show. But it's a marvelous example of where you have motional EMF in space. I want you to... Yeah, I just don't know if that's exactly what you're... You know, it's got to be dissected a little further, I think, to figure out exactly what you're doing, what you're getting. Uh, the idea, though, that this conductor is creating another current through this other medium as it's moving eight meters a second. I don't know, really think that's happening. Think about at home. Where does the energy come from? Because you're generating current. You could let a light bulb. The energy must come from somewhere. Think about that. <laughs> yes, you're crashing into a bunch of bits of stuff that's in what you call the ionosphere which is a bunch of ions so you're crashing into them at eight meters a second and you're likely to pick up some energy doing that absolutely interesting question by the way i linked you on the website to the tether all you have to do is click on it and you'll get some more information on this incredible experiment all right let's continue with the most important contribution faraday to our economy and that is so he always says that kind of stuff I, you know maybe i'll post the, the link to the video he just made today um where he's defending his uh, accusations against using karchoff's rule that i don't know why i can't say that but anyway this you know the whole circuit adds up to zero rule instead of using faraday's equations and um, you know, he, he says, well, if you believe that, then nothing could work in the world and light couldn't travel and nothing could happen. And, you know, it's just, um, a horrible argument, <laughs> you know, but this whole, the whole universe depends on this formula is just crap. Uh, obviously these are just discoveries about what kind of relationships there are. And lots of people discovered that you could move wires and you could make electricity static things happen and blah 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 and to say it at all this is critical to something is just it's useless exaggeration clearly yes our economy runs on the fact that we have figured out ways to uh, glean energy and produce work um, but those are all just discoveries of relationships that exist between these mechanisms and you know, <clears throat> one formula does not define it perfectly, in my opinion. The situation whereby we rotate a loop, a current loop, conducting loop could be rectangular, and we rotate it around with angular frequency omega. And for simplicity, let's have a magnetic field just straight up. This is supposed to be three-dimensional, that's my idea. 
and let this side be length A and this B. So if you look at it from this direction, you will only see the line B here, rotating like this with angular velocity omega, and a little later in time, it will be here. And so this length here is B, and so this length is B cosine theta. And let's assume, we call this angle theta, let's assume that it is here at t equals zero when theta is zero. I can choose that arbitrarily any way I want to, of course. And there could be a resistance R in this entire loop. And so the magnetic flux, phi of B, through a surface attached to this loop is B. That's constant, that's not changing. Now again, the surface makes no difference. The, the, the field is irrelevant. <laughs> They're just using area to define the, cir the, the circumference of the wire. So the length of the total length of the wire is being defined by taking the area of the space. <laughs> but that's all it is. The wire collects the energy, not any other way. And we have A times B, but remember, since it is a dot product between b dot dA, then you get the cosine theta in there, so you get a times b times cosine theta. So that's the flux. But cosine theta is changing with time. Theta is omega t, constant angular frequency omega. So the magnetic flux is a b b cosine omega t. So the phi dt, take the derivative, I get an omega, I get A, I get B, I get B, I get sine of omega t. If you're really interested in that minus sign, you get that automatically, there's nothing I can do about it. I get a minus sign there, but I'm not too much interested in minus signs. But since I get it, I can't shove it under the rug. So I put a minus sign here, and I change that into a plus one. The advantage is then that I have immediately the induced EMF. Notice that the induced EMF itself is linearly proportional with omega. And so... So the induced EMF is just what he's saying is how much current you're getting based on how much magnetism you've been you've ripped your wire through, therefore creating how much pressure inside the wire that's going to be basically voltage. <laughs> so and the voltage is basically what the EMF is. My induced current that is going to run in that loop is the induced EMF divided by the resistance of that loop. And so if the induced EMF is proportional to omega, so is the induced current. So if you go faster around, you get a higher current for the same resistor. You build motors, and during the price ceremony... I so again, uh, the point is, is the turning part changes. It creates the... So you pressurize something, then it stays pressurized and unless it, it can depressurize. And so the real point is, is for current to flow... There has to be a d two, two things. There are one's pressurized, one's low pressure, and there has to be a pathway to it. And um, so the only way you can keep that happening is you have to keep changing the field, so you change where the pressure is, so you can keep moving the pressure in some... Let's see how to say it. So you can keep moving the pressure. Because you can't move it. Once you push something into a corner, it's in the corner. You can't pressurize it anymore. It's pressurized. It's stuck there. If it doesn't have a direct way to depressurize, as I sort of pointed out, it needs the needs the direct path has to be around the outside. And <clears throat> if it can't find one, then it's just stuck being pressurized. So it can't be repressurized. That is, you can't create more current. You know, more uh, exchanges between atoms and their pressure. Um, you know, until you let it depressurize. I told you that the faster your motor rotates, the larger an induced EMF is, which is generated in the loop. You had a magnetic field, which let's assume is more or less constant. Of course, it wasn't in your case, but let's assume for the sake of argument. Well, in the case of the motor, it's exactly the opposite. You're, the more current you put in, the more rotations you're going to get. So, I don't know. No. And as your motor was going to rotate, there was an induced current generated by Mr. Faraday, which is proportional to omega, so the current is larger when your motor goes faster, and that induced current opposes the current which was produced by your battery. And perhaps you remember that I did a demonstration with the winning motor, 
I blocked the rotor, and I showed you that the current through the rotor, when it was blocked, when omega was zero, was 1.6 amperes. Simply Ohm's law. Battery, voltage V, resistance R, the current is V divided by R. Then we ran the motor, and the current went down enormously by a factor of 40. It was only 40 milliampers the time average current when the motor was running. The re right, but that's the torque on all motors. I mean, obviously, momentum is a huge advantage once it gets going. Uh, you know, then it just takes, you can add extra easy. But starting is always tough. This is what you see here. You get an induced EMF, an induced current, which opposes the current from the battery. Obviously, if you want to move something, the propulsive force is very useful. The attractive one is a little more complicated. Uh, pushing is easier than pulling. LR circuits. I prefer to stay on the center board, although I could go there, but I don't think we need this anymore. Can I cover this? Most of you are happy with that. I could work there, but I prefer to stay at the center. LR circuits. With LR circuits, we have the embarrassment, not for us, but for some others, that almost all textbooks, college physics, do not understand Faraday's law. So, so, so again, he just says in Faraday's law. First, it's not a law. Um, second, um, what they understand is, is that in all practical circumstances, there's a certain component of Faraday's equation that's sort of um, useless. <laughs> because it doesn't really apply um, <clears throat> in the sense that um, uh, if, if all you want to know is what's the running how, how, how does the what's the circuit do when it's running not what it's doing when it's initializing or what it's you know when you're turning power on and off or some other thing but just when it's running then essentially there's very little that can go that, that, that part of Faraday's equation just doesn't have any relevance and so you can just do this easy Kirchhoff's loop rule thing and it just simplifies the equation um, and so he says everybody doesn't understand Faraday just because they say well yeah the shortcut always works so why not use it and therefore they treat the subject incorrectly embarrassing but of course since they know the answer but their physics is totally wrong well, I, and I would argue that his physics is totally wrong. You, they don't understand what this electromotive force is, this EMF. They don't understand <laughs> what photons are or anything else. They don't understand what this force is, what magnetism is. So they're all getting the you know, right answer for wrong reasons. I will address but, but, the problem which <clears throat> I found on, on the website when I looked at Professor Belcher's exams. He has one very nice problem. So, um, yeah, so the issue is, is he, he wants to believe, he's saying, that there's some reality to this idea that you measure two points with two different meters exactly at the same place. And somehow it makes some sort of sense that the two meters have different readings. And the only way that makes sense is that something's happening to your detecting device, okay? <laughs> because clearly there can't be two different voltages in the same location. It's just stupid. So, you know, here he is, I mean, that's sort of an insult to him, but he's insulting everybody else. So I suppose it's fair enough just to say it's just kind of retarded to think that there can actually be two different voltages in exactly the same location. That's just kind of silly. ...of an LR circuit, and I will go through that with you. We have an AC power supply. V equals V0 cosine omega T. The frequency is 60 hertz. This comes out of the wall. And so omega, which is 2 pi F, is about 377 radians per second. And V0, in this case, 100 volts. And we have here the cell inductor. And here we have a light bulb. And the light bulb has a resistance, which is 100 ohms. And this self-inductor is variable. We don't know yet how you make a variable self-inductor, but we will learn that very shortly, either Friday or next week, I forgot. The self-inductance can be increased over a certain range. And the first question 
that Professor Belcher is asking is what is the energy dissipation in this light bulb? The closed loop integral of E dot dl is not zero because Kirchhoff's loop rule does not apply here. Uh, is there is a self inductor. If you attach an open surface to this closed loop, he's just basically saying apply because he says so. Uh, but clearly, you could apply it. No, but he's just saying he wouldn't apply it because he doesn't. He thinks it's important to recognize. Um, I don't know what he thinks it's important to recognize. Tell you the truth. See, the whole problem with the inductor is is that it's also a, whatever you would call it, a thing that's going to make induction happen in all, everything around it. It's creating a magnetic field. And that magnetic field is going to affect the wires around it. And uh, that's the whole reason why it's an inductor, is because it's affecting itself. The coil of wire is creating a magnetic field. The magnetic field goes faster than the current through the loops. The current through the loops takes time to go this way. The magnetic field it's creating goes this way fast as the speed of light. So it's ahead of the current. And so it's pre-pressurizing the wire ahead of it. So it's making it difficult for the current to move through the wire because it's taking away the opportunity to go from high pressure to low pressure. There's a magnetic flux going through there. So you must deal with the third equation there. You must deal with Faraday's law, no matter what your textbooks tell you. Kirchhoff loop rule does not hold. And if you do that correctly, you end up with the right differential equation, which happens to be the same one that those people find who do not understand the physics, but they get the same equation. They massage things in such a way that they get the same answer. And the answer then is that the current that is going to flow as a result of this uh, getting this, you know, yeah, they, they end up with the same end up uh, end up formula because they do what you do in most of your formulas. They cross out this and cross out that, and da, 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 and so what's the difference? You're basically conceding that it's correct that in the end it does fit, it does work. So what's the difference? Voltage, variable voltage, that current I is a maximum value times the cosine omega t minus phi that the maximum current itself is v0 divided by the square root of r squared plus omega l squared and that the tangent of phi is omega l divided by r I spent quite some time on this during one of my lectures and so the maximum current that will flow depends on omega and depends on L, on the self inductance, of course, on the resistor as well. In Professor Belcher's problem, he starts off with L equals zero, and he asks, what is the power dissipated in this light bulb? If L equals zero, this term is not there, and so you simply have Ohm's law, I equals V0 divided by R, so I max is 100 divided by 100 is 1 ampere. But then he asks you something that will give you the hiccups. And that is, what is now the time averaged power dissipated in that light bulb? And you remember, or should remember, that 1 half I squared R is the power dissipated in the light bulb. If I is the current through the light bulb, and R is the resistance of the light bulb, and we will assume that the resistance is independent of the current, independent of temperature. But I is changing with time in a cosine sort of fashion. And so now you have to be able to evaluate the time average of a cosine square omega t function. And the time average of a cosine squared or sine square omega t function is always one half. You like to remember that rather than spending five minutes on deriving that. And so this time averaged is then going to be one half times i max squared times r. And by the way, sorry, the I was, I was ahead of myself is my, my I square R is the energy that is dissipated, right, in the, in the resistor, not one half I square R. It is I square R. And because of the time average of the cosine square function, I get my one half there. And so it's very easy now 
I max is one ampere, R is 100, and this factor of one half, which comes from the time average of the square of this function, the phi has nothing to do with that, the average of, of the cosine square of this function is one half, and you get 50 watts. And now, he calls this device a light dimmer, now he is going to increase L to 300 millihenries. So L now becomes 300 millihenry. A 300 millihenry omega L is 113 ohms. I multiply 300 by the 377. And now I find that this time average value, which is now one half times this, I find that I max, I put in for omega L 113 squared, 100 squared, I max is now 0.67 amperes. I put that in this equation and I find that the power is now about 22 watts. So that's what a light dimmer is doing for you. So you turn off the self-inductance and now your light is dimmer. Now, uh, now I don't know if that's how most light dimmers work, but what part of this? Um, as I pointed out, what I think the self-inductor is doing, it's changing the voltage, what ends up changing the wattage, which ends up changing the current. <laughs> this, if you change the volt, something has to change. But anyway, continuing. A very deep, very deep, maybe nasty conceptual question. Why would one want to build a light dimmer with a self-inductor? Why not putting here a variable resistor and then turning up the resistor so that the current, which when the resistor is zero, the current is one ampere, so you get your 50 watts, but then you increase that resistor so that the current <clears throat> goes down to 0.67 amperes, and then... Because you'd have to dissipate the extra current, the extra voltage, the extra wattage as heat. The light bulb will dissipate 22 joules per second. Why would you not put here a variable resistor, but why a variable self-inductor? If you can answer that question, that shows that you have a deep insight already in 802. I promise you I will not ask this question Wednesday. But I may ask it on the final. Well, that sort of sucks. Could have, you know, we could have enjoyed the answer, but I think it's just because of the heat. Displacement current. Displacement current is always a little bit problematic in the sense that there are not too many problems that you can do with displacement current. This is here, this displacement current term that, M that uh, Maxwell added to Ampere's law. The only application at this stage in 802 that I can think of is the one that I hit very hard during my lectures. You have plate capacitor, discs, they are circular plates, and you charge the capacitor or discharge the capacitor. And you can calculate now using this law what the magnetic field is in between the capacitor plates. I advise you to check your notes from that lecture or watch the lecture again on the web. The lecture is on the web. Then some fatherly advice when it comes to the exam itself. I would advise you to read a problem at least twice to make sure that you fully understand the text. If you read fast, at least that happens to me, you sometimes misread, at least I often misread. I would then advise you to do the easiest problems first. What may be the easiest for you may not be the easiest for you. <coughs> do the easiest for you first. If you get stuck on a problem, never spend more than 10 minutes on one problem. Immediately abandon it then when you see that it's grinding yourself into a hole and go to another problem. Between now and Wednesday, I would suggest you see tutors if you need them. You can see your instructor. I have office hours this afternoon. I'll make myself as much available today as I can. Tomorrow afternoon, I will be in 26100 working on the demonstrations for you for next week. So I'm not available tomorrow. I wish you luck and I'll see you on Wednesday. Very exciting. All right, well, that was sort of a, yeah, <laughs> yeah not much to deal with there um, <clears throat> that aren't already subjects dealt with individually. So, <clears throat> yeah, so, yeah. Not every video can be, you know, <laughs> whatever. Um, so, um, I don't think that I have anything to add. Um, kind of funny that he just pointed out how the displacement currents don't have much applicability to anything. And again, like, so then why is Maxwell's improvement so important? I mean, maybe Maxwell shouldn't be given a 
uh, credit for an equation that all he did was add something to it that nobody really has to worry about. But anyway, just, whatever, just being cranky, I suppose. So, till the next time, and such.